Hello and welcome to a new episode of OTT Talks. I am Enrique Mendizabal, founder and director of OTT, a global consultancy and platform for change, supporting and championing evidence-informed progress. OTT Talks is a series of friendly conversations with thought leaders and practitioners in the field of evidence-informed policy and the think tank sector. In today's episode, we are exploring the subject of alternative think tank models and I guess alternative think tank markets. This topic came up at the OTT 2023 conference in London at Chatham House this May. And Simon Maxwell put forward an idea during one of our sessions. And it was that given the mounting challenges facing think tanks and the increasingly costly investments necessary to overcome them, plus the relatively risk averse nature of policy research funding, it is becoming difficult to sustain more than a few well-resourced and effective think tanks. He asked, would it make more sense instead to invest in policy research ecosystems that are led by one or two large and sustainable organizations surrounded by smaller, specialized and re well-resourced centers, research groups, collaborators, or individuals that generate innovative ideas, help communicate recommendations, facilitate engagement, with local communities, etc. In fact, I would argue that this is more or less what we have today in practice in many think tank markets and communities. In most countries, there are a few very large and well-resourced think tanks that attract most of the funding and attention, and many small cash-strapped think tanks that barely make ends meet. The situation is worse in many parts of the global south. Across Africa, for instance, just a handful of think tanks are in most research funders' portfolios. So it's not strange to find a think tank with millions of dollars in untouched reserves in their bank accounts competing for funding with organizations that can barely pay their wages. I think this is a question worth exploring and here to help us do it, of course, is Simon Maxwell. Simon is a development economist and former director of, of ODI in the UK, which is a large think tank, I should say. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, UK. Okay. Um, thank you. So let me let me go back to the original idea and say that we just released um, our State of the Sector report for 2023. And to some extent, the report supports this argument. Nearly half of think tanks surveyed globally said that it's getting much harder to operate as a think tank. Only 15% 15 said that it was getting easier. They argue that the political context is worsening. That the funding landscape for 2023 turned out to be worse than they expected. And more than 50% of them predict that the, the context is going to get worse in years ahead. So in your intervention at the conference, you suggested that it is really hard to make a mark as a public intellectual. The one needs resources to explore new topics, stay ahead of the current agenda, build networks and coalitions, build audiences, etc. So you add to this increasingly pol difficult political context and it gets harder, right? You need certain scale. Is that is that is that your argument? Is that what you're trying to challenge us to think about? That you need certain scale to operate effectively? Or is this anything else that that I missed? No, well, you know, if if you think about the environment in which we all live it reminds me of those nature programs you see on television all the little turtles hatch out and they race to the sea or the fish emerge or the butterflies emerge from their cocoons and there are thousands of them and then the predators gather and accidents happen and baby seals fall off the cliff and eventually only a few of this large population survive because they're all subject to the terrible forces of natural selection. And when I look at all the think tanks around the world, I sometimes think these are the baby turtles struggling to reach the sea with too many dangers and not enough support. And of course, in our world, it's not that you've got some huge predator about to gobble you up, but the question that we face uh, always is, how do you make your voice heard? How do you influence policy? And if you put yourself on the other side of the fence, you've got all these policymakers sitting there, their inboxes, their in trays, their meeting schedules are absolutely full of people coming from think tanks. They've all polished their elevator pitch. They've all got the background papers ready and they all want you to do something and it's all different and or often different. And so that's the problem that we face. We've got a, a multitude of people, all the turtles trying to reach the sea, only some will. How do we empower the ones uh, 
that we want to succeed? How do we make it easier for the turtles to land in the right place? Yeah. So I mean, I, I love how you uh, how you paint the paint a picture. I think you have a you have a gift for that. But uh, a couple of things come you know come to mind about that. One first question, of course, is who gets to choose which turtles survive, right? In the wild, I guess it's the it's a little bit of the the strongest wins, but also luck, right? So it's the turtle that wasn't wasn't seen by the seagull, I guess, um, on the way to the on the way to the sea. Um, but also um, to some extent, I mean, I, I see your point about the other side of the fence and some policymakers being overwhelmed with information, not just think tanks, um, from think tanks, but from consultancies, from the media, from individuals of advocacy, advocates and NGOs, from their constituents sometimes. But at the same time, there are, you know, and this is what we get a feeling of, there are many policymakers out there dealing with specific parts of the world uh, on specific issues. That are not necessarily being inundated with um, with uh, with information and ideas and recommendations. So is it is it partly um, that think tanks tend to focus on just a few uh, policymakers um, or a few policy opportunities, and maybe they could maximize the chances of survival if they they, they didn't all follow the same you know the same path to the sea, right? So if they all sort of took different paths um and in you know in that way sort of mo more more of them could survive yeah well obviously every little bit of our ecosystem is different and there may be uh, you know we talk about food deserts places in towns where you can't buy fresh vegetables because the supermarkets only serve certain exactly. districts so uh, information schools. deserts <laughs> so yeah you know, or, or, or even worse than an information desert is a think tank desert oh my goodness <laughs> but um, I th what we want to avoid in our world, I think, is the situation where the person who has the minister's uh, WhatsApp telephone number in their WhatsApp directory is the person who is going to get the minister's ear and nobody else. Exactly. And there is always a risk that you have a political structure where networks matter so much that the only people who, who succeed are those who have the right telephone numbers in there in their WhatsApp. And you might have a brilliant idea, but nobody's listening. And that is, of course, the, you know, the great fear that you're standing at the edge of the canyon, shouting your message into the ether, and it echoes back to you, but there's nobody listening because the canyon is empty. So if you're a small think tank, and you don't have the connections, uh, that's always the risk. And of course, you and I know, Kike, because we've worked on it for a long time, that there are certain things think tanks can do to amplify their voice. They have to have the elevator pitch right. They have to have the good story. They do need to have the networks. They need to be practical. They need to be putting things in at the right moment. But one of the big solutions that we have is the idea of the think tank alliance and working together uh, and trying to find common platforms where you can amplify uh, your voice and I, and, and I like that idea and it works with the think tank alliance idea works really well when you think for instance of the European think tank group which you you, you help fund uh, found you know create um, it wasn't easy I, I remember but now I think it's a it's a it's a thriving thriving network but I think there you've got um, I think one think tank per country um, right trying to work on European policy and sort of it sort of makes sense right there's no competition um but it would be different to think about the european think tank group if you for instance looked at westminster right so westminster think tank group um would that you know would would that lead to what you're saying right on, on education only one has a voice on health only one has a voice um um or all the other smaller organizations would be would be left out so, well, I, do, yeah, I don't think it would quite work like that. Uh, these days, I work quite a lot on climate change. And what is so interesting always in the run up to the annual COP meeting, the, right. the conference of the parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, is that everybody who works on climate change, uh, it's like children in the classroom when everybody puts up their hand at the same time. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to contribute to the discussion. And I'm keeping a kind of running list of all the big reports that are coming out from international organizations and think tanks uh, last week, this week, and 
next week and, and probably during the COP um, as well, you get a cacophony of voices. They all say more or less the same thing, but in slightly different ways. And, you know, one example is uh, we have to cut emissions by a certain amount by a certain date but every single report you read has a slightly different starting date a slightly different finishing date a slightly def different definition of greenhouse gases a slightly different calculation of what the cut needs to be and i tried to imagine myself sitting on the plane on the way to the cop and my you know my staff as i'm a minister have given me a large briefing suitcase full of all these reports to read and I'm thinking to myself how on earth do I make sense of this and wouldn't it be better if if they somehow or other work together um, and if there were uh, if you like coordinated messages between them and I think the same applies if you go to the national level now when I was working in London I tried to set up a London climate change think tanks group um, uh, and I tried I brought together f several times maybe half a dozen, maybe as many as 10 different think tanks in London, all working on climate change, with the idea that we might organize some meetings together. And we did. We organized a couple of things together. Uh, and there was some collaboration between us all. Uh, now I'm no longer there. I don't know whether that's still going. Probably it isn't. But even if you're in a national context with multiple voices, there is some benefit to be had, I think you know, in competing with each other, in, in collaborating with each other. But if I can continue for just a second, this is always going to be a relationship of collaborative competition or competitive collaboration because yeah. each of these institutes has their own brand. And I remember when I was at ODI convening a couple of meetings of people who were then the heads of policy of all the big NGOs in the UK, Oxfam, Save the Children, and so on, Action Aid, so on and so forth. And of course, it was what you've said, Kike, is completely true. You know, all these people had their own priorities. They wanted to run their own campaigns. They had their own supporters. And they weren't going to subsume their own particular priorities in some soup. You know, you don't want to be with your soup spoon going around in the minestrone looking for each individual um, uh, contribution, each individual letter in the minestrone. Uh, so people wanted to preserve their independence and their their own voice, and of course that's true. So, which which leads us to um, one aspect of think tank work that has been growing significantly over over the years, which is you know the communication, branding, positioning. I think um, you know. At OTT and when I was at, at ODI with you, we we surely advocated for think tanks to spend more um, in communications, right? Engagement with their audiences and their public in in developing strong brands. I mean that the size of the budgets of some think tanks only on branding, only on a microsite, right? Only on the design of a annual report or a, or a flagship report. Can easily be the whole the whole budget for you know for annual budget of a small think tank you know working in the same field and competing with them, and I think there's a big push towards um, making sure that it's my report that is the one that is referenced, right? It's my research that is this considered. I think what you're what you're alluding to is a is a is um I guess is a world in which think tanks are worried less about their evidence being used and think tanks worrying more about evidence being used right so this idea of a think tank not as an organization maybe but as a process right um organizing a process through which think tanks working on the same issue can discuss debate present distill right synthesize uh, summarize and present ministers or decision makers whatever they are with you know, you know, as good enough of a consensus as we can arrive, right? With some options and a description of the differences of opinion, so that the decision maker can make an informed informed decision, not worrying about oh, it was you know, it was my report that actually you know, that actually made it to page one of the T twenty or G twenty communique, for instance, right? Or the or the COP resolution, etc. Yes, but I think 
uh, it's interesting that when you convene think tanks and you look around the table, they do have very different perspectives. You know, think tanks are generally, sometimes think tanks are carefully politically neutral and uh, independent of party and so on, but quite often, <coughs> excuse me, quite often in many countries, think tanks uh, are politically motivated, politically driven, yeah. politically aligned. Is I, think, the best I think that's term. usually that's usually the case. I think the the very neutral one is the exception to the rule. Yeah. So then, what you, so then they're not necessarily going to agree. But you said something very important early on, which is about the importance of brand. And if you're the policymaker sitting on the other side of the desk, so to speak and you receive a research report, how do you know whether these people are any good? Exactly. And of course, the starting point is the quality of the, re the report and of the peer review process and the referencing that it has gone through. And a question every policymaker should ask themselves when they open the post and the brown envelope is there and there's a report inside, you know, are these people serious? Um, uh, is this is this a serious report and, and should I read it now if you produce a series of reports which are not serious then you can expect your post to end up in the waste paper bin and be sent for recycling so you have to build the brand and it isn't just a question of spending a huge amount of money on communication the fundamental job of a think tank is to think and and to produce reports which are you know well substantiated sure um, but but at the same but i think but at the same time it does it does happen that brands can be built and we you know we see that happening can be built not necessarily um on the basis of poor poor research but the better resourced organizations are going to find it much easier to get on you know get that op-ed in the newspaper at the same time make sure that they appear in you know all of the policymakers social media you know um, spaces uh, make sure that they organize, you know, relatively well, well known, you know, high profile, uh, well attended events, at a, you know, around a, a particular decision making process or around a particular event. So it's a better is the is the is the organizations with more resources that are more likely to be visible to those uh, those decision makers. And if they are good, right, they'll get they'll get noticed for sure. You know, they'll be used. But they might be very good organizations out there in terms of the quality of the research. It's just they don't have the connections, they don't have the the resources to be as visible um, as 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 others. Um, so that that inequality is always going to be there. I'm not. I, I guess. I guess. <laughs> I guess what I would ask is, what is the role of funding? Right. So I think we've been talking about what think tanks can do, and I think I think it's right to assume that think tanks are not. Uh, and not neutral is right to avoid the assumption that think tanks, you know, don't have their own their own you know missions to uh, to deliver and their own mandates to deliver, right? So their boards are telling them you have to be more influential, you have to grow, right? You have to compete with other organizations, you have to position your brands, and I think it's it's fair that that's where the leadership is doing. But what about funders? Can funders play a role in uh, making the playing field a little bit more equal? in giving more opportunities to other voices to come in into the conversation. Um, is there anything they can do to, to, to deliver that? Well, of course, the bane of all think tanks, large or small, is always funding. But I, I think the question you raise is an interesting one, which is, what does a small think tank do? What does the minnow do, the small fish do in a, in a, in a tank full of sharks? Right. And I suppose I've just founded, helped to found a small think tank in my home city, which is Brighton and Hove in the UK, which at the moment is just a couple of us trying to build the brand. Um, luckily, in Brighton and Hove, there isn't a great deal. There aren't many sharks. There isn't a great deal of competition. So we're kind of swimming around happily amongst the seaweed. Um, but people do say to us, well, excuse me, but who are you? And you know, why do we trust you? And I've always thought that there are, there are certain things that you have to do to build your brand. Of course, one is the quality of the work. Uh, in the end, governance is going to be important. So you have to make sure that you have the right kind of advisory board or governing body. Uh, and we're on the way to do that with our think tank. 
um, you have to have a set of values and have transparency available on your on your website. And what we're doing is building transparency, not by having a point of view, a building, sorry, building brand, not by having a point of view, but by being a neutral forum and trying to have some kind of convening uh, power so that we are organizing meetings, for example, commissioning uh, guest blogs. At the moment, we're very small, but who knows, in, some, in, in due time, we may become a, a more influential voice and be able to bring in people who, who, who do have a point of view. And at that point, maybe somebody will come along and fund us. So I don't think we can imagine, like the famous painting of Venus by Botticelli when she arrives floating on a seashell out of the sea perfectly formed. I don't think think tank formation is like that. You know, think tank is a more like a kind of primeval. You come out of the the ooze and you start to grow lungs, and then you grow feet, and then you end up on the land. So, I think we have to think about it in a fairly um, uh, uh, iterative way. And of course, you know, you're right. Funders can play a part in that. And if I was funding think tanks, I would be looking for these uh, embryonic but possibly potentially influential bodies that I can help to grow. And what what do you expect your relationship with larger think tanks, say London-based or national nationally focused think tanks, to be, for instance, as a smaller organization, as a newer organization, in this broader ecosystem? Is there is there a relationship that can be built, uh, mutually beneficial mutually beneficial relationship that can be built? There are large think tanks and there are small think tanks. I think the model of collaborative competition is always has to be the answer. So there will be areas in which you can support them and they can support you. Um, and maybe you have, uh, I remember in, in, in European Development Corporation, they were talking at one time about division of labor between member states. And there was one person in one country who knew about, I can't even remember what it was now, uh, dairy production in the Amazon, let's say. Uh, so it doesn't matter who you were in Europe, but there was this one person in one country who knew about dairy production in the Amazon. So if you needed that expertise, you'd go there. So the small think tank will have expertise um, on, you know, you are the dairy production in the Amazon think tank. So all the big guys are going to have to come knocking at your door because they don't have that expertise. So again, it comes back to your your knowledge and your knowledge is power, isn't it, in our world? Knowledge and expertise is power. Yeah, and I guess knowledge is not just about what you know, but what you know in terms of subject matter, but also what you know in terms of what you can do or who you know in the communities where you are. So we find um, we find more and more think tanks across the world are more concerned about how to connect more with their communities, for example, like really like their local communities, like the neighborhoods in which they're based, the cities in which they, in which you know all their staff come from often. Um, because of because often they've been focused on national policy questions, but they've left um, they've forgotten about what goes on, you know, in their backyard, you know, in their neighborhood. But they haven't built those relationships with local governments and local councillors and and neighborhood groups, etc. And so they have to go through other kinds of organisations to achieve those connections. And smaller think tanks might be able to do that. Smaller think tanks also might be able to innovate, like take risks, I guess, on. On policy issues or issues that are yet you know understudied where there isn't enough evidence there isn't enough information they might be able to bring bring forward innovative ideas challenging ideas and see them tested in uh in in public debate and and, and discussion maybe a larger think tank will be more worried about putting forward a um, untested recommendation um for fear of losing their reputation or losing the access that they have with some policymakers. Yeah, but I don't know what your experience is. I'd like to hear a bit more about it. But working in small think tanks is also tremendously hard work, actually. You know, I was really struck by the work I've been doing this year, setting up our think tank, which is called Climate Colon Change. But there's a lot of infrastructure that if you work in a large institution, you take for granted that somebody else has thought about. So, of course, you want a website, but you've got to register a domain name and get your email addresses. You want to organize meetings, but you need to have liability insurance before anybody will hire you um, a venue. 
Uh, you need to be able to receive donations, but you can't do that unless you are a registered organization and you have a bank account. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time this year doing that kind of paperwork. And I often think about the whole experiences of small businesses. Um, and it, it's often really, you know, not just in the think tank world, but in the world, it's really hard for a small business to survive. And I remember when I first started at ODI back in the 1990s, we were much smaller than ODI is now. It's grown enormously since I left in, in 2009. And in 1997, when I started, we were even smaller. And then the question was, can we afford a receptionist? Uh, can we afford a public affairs person? Um, who's going to do our, our computer infrastructure? Um, who's going to move the chairs from one room to another when we have a meeting? And if you're very small, each of those questions becomes a demand on resources, but also on management time. So you have you know, a number of options. Do you stay the same and you carry on struggling with that? Do you sometimes shrink even further? So I'll come back to that. Do you grow? Do you find a way of merging or collaborating with somebody else? And when I first started at ODI, Kiki, I went round and visited all the think tanks in uh, London as in the way that, you know, when a new ambassador arrives in a the country, they have courtesy calls. So I paid courtesy calls on quite a lot of think tanks to introduce myself. And one of the things I observed was that there were some very, very small think tanks which basically had no resources at all. I mean, they had they had one room somewhere. And what they would do is find a brilliant academic at Cambridge or at Oxford. They would commission that person to write a paper. Uh, the person would sit in their university and write it. The university would pay all their overheads, would heat their office, yep. would provide the canteen. Then they would come to London uh, and launch the report and the think tank might organize a dinner with ministers or a public launch event and then this person would very thankfully go back to their university to cambridge or to oxford um, and there were no overheads at all no costs at all for the think tank so i what i saw was there was a viable option for the very small think tank there was of course a viable option for the very large think tank for all the reasons that you've said lots of resources lots of funders everybody knows their name they've got a big brand exactly. and then the difficult territory that we all deal with is that territory in the middle yeah where you can't afford a receptionist what do you do do you go yeah. down to the level where you're just one room or do you go up to the level where you've got you know more receptionists that you can squeeze into a lift uh, and and uh that is a management dilemma for people who run think tanks. And I learned about that when I was studying farmers in the Amazon in Bolivia, uh, you know, many years ago, where we had farmers who were very tiny and did all the work themselves and wanted to grow. And then we had farmers who were quite a lot bigger, who had, had a tractor and they had bigger farms. The people who wanted to grow we had one case in particular he managed to double his land area he was doing really well uh he was hiring labor he was uh, selling much more but his profit was actually lower because instead of being a farmer himself he was spending all his time looking for labor hiring labor buying fertilizer okay. selling stuff and he was caught in that mid-sized trap i mean let's call it the small trap the small think tank trap when you go mm -hmm. from being self-sufficient to commercial and I think that's a very interesting topic, actually, for on think tanks is to think about yeah. who's caught in that trap and how do they get out of it. Yeah, exactly. I think I think I think you're right. I think that is a it's an excellent way to put it. Um, and again, it makes me think about sort of connecting it to this idea of of an ecosystem in which there's a few large ones or smaller ones, and the role that the large ones could play um, if the funders, for instance, encourage them to do that because. You know, there's no there's no reason why um, in the you know with, with the right terms of reference in a way a larger think tank could host you as a startup you know with your own brand um, and benefit from having a you know a group of you know eager and motivated people thinking about an issue that maybe they don't have the time to think about or they haven't developed yet a program for and um, and create the space. You know their research would benefit their brand would benefit and at the same time you don't have to deal with those sort of startup 
troubles and costs that you know that you know everything from the as you say the you know email account domain but also the space that you might need for events and the and the well, support think, you might need for for connections one of the things we can learn from is the revolution in office working that's taken place since the pandemic and now everywhere you go you see these co-working sites exactly uh, it's not just we work but there are many others some of which are quite small as well as quite large and there was a time in london where there was a building near waterloo station which housed half a dozen different think tanks um and and they were able to share some infrastructure share some space share some meeting space uh, but and also of course feed off each other so one of the things that funders could do is help these kind of uh you know incubation offices where there are a number of people who are working together and that would be a good thing for funders to do because out of that diversity of think tanks some will grow some will succeed and some will not yeah and i guess the uh the physical space could also i mean i would work but also you've got the sort of digital space right so your websites your social media campaigns a lot of those things can be handled uh so centrally uh, or can be handled in a way that benefit more than a single single organization especially during that during that initial period as you say um anyway lots lots of ideas to unpack this this challenging idea about a a think tank community think tank field in which maybe two or three dominate and others provide more specialized dynamic you know bespoke uh services or insights um is not necessarily you know as you know it doesn't necessarily need to happen exactly as 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 that description suggests but it can it can come in many in many flavors and nuances as well and it can actually benefit uh promoting much greater diversity uh of think tanks right if we think that the think tanks are not ecstatic right? they're not going to be the same size forever that the think tank community itself is not a static not all think tanks that exist now they're going to exist in in a few years time or you know they haven't existed for a while so a very dynamic future for for these organizations so i think well, i think for, we should have a project together sometime on small think tank incubation and the small yeah. think tank the small think tank trap is definitely something worth exploring in on think tanks the mid-sized think tank trap i think i think yeah. I, mean, I, I agree i think i think the small think tanks you know, the new think tanks for all the trouble you're facing right now to some extent you've got that freedom you've got that ability to operate right you've got that overhead the lack of overhead right now right but in a few in a few years if you are you know moderately su successful those questions that you were asking yourself start to um start to come in again and and then the challenges uh, will will emerge but it's certainly a an important an important project and the survey that we run for the state of the sector report suggests that there are very clear differences in the way that the smaller and larger think tanks perceive the challenges that they face whether it's funding or the political context but smaller think tanks for sure uh, perceive these as much greater challenges than their much larger counterparts so in the way that we support these organizations also has to reflect the, the kind of organizations that, that they are Anyway, thank you very much, Simon. I don't want to take more of your time. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be right back with more episodes soon. And do check the other episodes that we have for conversations with think tankers, funders, policymakers who are offering us their own insights and perspectives on the exciting field of evidencing from policy. Thank you very much, Simon. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Kike. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.